Uh, this is Ari Paparo, the CEO of Beeswax. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I'm here with Rick Bruner. So, Rick, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello. My name is Rick Bruner. I am CEO of a company called Central Control, which focuses on ad experiments. I've been kicking around this industry for a long time. Ari and I were colleagues at DoubleClick more than 10 years ago, where I ran research. I ran research at Google, was at Marketing Evolution, and elsewhere. Yeah, Rick and I are the famous originators of the terrible click-through rates that people like to talk about. When they say, oh, people don't click on banners less than getting eaten by sharks. That is Rick's and I, our invention. <laughs> uh, so um, thank you for joining us. So this webinar is meant to be educational. So we are, um, it actually, the origin of this content was around a, a presentation I was doing to some of our employees who were new to ad tech to explain the concepts of attribution. Um, and it's a very hot topic. We hear about it in the marketplace all the time. So what we've uh, put together here is a presentation that starts at the very, very basics um, around last click and all those fun concepts and goes right to the cutting edge around ghost ads and, uh, and the stuff that Rick's been working on. So let's just dive right in. Um, so let's start with a, you know, a quick example. Um, if you look in Wikipedia around some of these issues around correlation and causation, what you see is that this example, which is young children who sleep with a light on or mo are more likely to develop myopia in later life, otherwise known as uh, nearsightedness. Um, therefore, sleeping with the light on causes myopia. But actually, the study found that there was a strong link between your parents having myopia and the child having myopia. You basically, people who wear glasses have kids who wear glasses. And the fact is that people who are myopic were more likely to leave the light on in their children's bedroom. So uh, the, it was not causation, it was correlation. Right. So what we're trying to do here is talk about, did my ads work, which is as simple as the consumer sees the ad, the consumer buys something. Was it cause or was it just correlated? Seems simple, but uh, we've spent our entire careers trying to figure this out. So what we're going to go through in this webinar pretty quickly, uh, we'll probably try to get, get us out of here in a half an hour, is, uh, is of kind of the history of attribution from the most simple concepts of last click, last impression, the, uh, the hot topic of multi-touch, which has gotten a little colder, uh, and then talking about um, the uh, attribution incrementality and uh, some other non-online techniques. So let's dive right in. All right, so last click. So this is probably familiar to many of you on the phone, but let's just talk about it and we'll run through it. So if you think about the exposure path of, of a user and how they may have been exposed to various impressions and clicks over the time in which uh, we have information and then convert it, um, you might have a diagram like this where you have a publisher serving some ads, an ad network, and a second ad network who are all showing ads in different ways. And the and who gets credit? Who is being who is being held up as causing the conversion? Well, the last click, right? That's why it's called last click. So if you have a different view where no one clicked, there were no clicks, what gets impression what gets credit as the causing agent of the conversion? Well, the last impression. You could obviously tell this is pretty arbitrary. When I say causal agent, uh, you should put that in quotes. Uh, I think that uh, no scientist would ever agree that that actually caused the conversion, but that is effectively what attribution schemes do. Okay, gets a little more complicated. User clicked twice, what happens? Well, the last click, it's called last click as you know. So the last click gets the credit. Okay, what about here? So this is where you start having to scratch your head. Someone clicked a while ago, not recently, but then they were exposed to other impressions, which gets credit. Well, in the last click attribution, the click still does, even though the click may have been a long time ago and they may have seen some very impactful ads later. Okay, well, now we introduce the concept of look-back windows, very commonly used in virtually every ad server, DSP, and other, and other technology. The idea here being, Let's say that after some certain arbitrary amount of time in the past, we're no longer going to give credit to things. Um, and so it commonly the default in many systems will be a 30 day look back. So if you have a 30 day look back window and your last click was more recent than 30 days, it still gets credit. Okay, but what happens if you have a 15 day look back and the click is more than 15 days ago? Does the click get credit anymore? No, the click is now ignored because the uh, look back window was set more recently than the last click. So you can tell 
how arbitrary this is that someone decided that 15 days was the right amount of time. And under the previous scheme where you had a 30 day look back, the click was considered golden. The most important obviously was causal uh, to the conversion. Now we have a 15 day look back and the click as if it never happens. Okay. Now, making it a little more complicated. And so, once again, this is very common in every ad serving and DSP system. You have a mixture of lookbacks. So, the, the idea being that a click, as we say in last click, is the most important thing. But an impression, what's sometimes called view through attribution, so the impression caused the conversion, is much more dubious. So, just because I saw an ad 30 days ago, the odds of that causing the conversion today are very low. Of course, that's the whole point of advertising is showing people ads, but this is how the system has developed. So you might have a dual look back window with a short one for impressions, a longer one for clicks, and you can guess what's going to happen in this case. The click is going to get the credit because it's more recent than the 30 day click look back. So lots of problems. Let's, let's, let's talk about how bad all of this is. Okay, so simple example, and, I, and throughout this presentation, we are using real examples, but they're not intended to be case studies or representative of uh, the business of beeswax or central control. They're just being used for familiarity. So in this example, we have the New York Times homepage with an incredibly rich uh, interactive creative ad, um, and the user has 100% share of voice where they're actually looking at this ad. It's inevitable if you're on the New York Times homepage that you're looking at this ad. And then the exact same advertiser has a below the fold text ad on a, on a tech site, uh, right? So, um, so which is more impactful? Well, it, in last click, last impression, it's, uh, it's basically an algorithm that says that the last one that was seen, this, the below the fold ad gets credit, even though the times ad is so much more impactful in terms of the mental experience of the user and the affinity of the ad, et cetera. Um, another problem is sometimes called stuffing the cookie. So if you know that the last impression is going to be given credit and you want to get credit to increase your budgets, what you're going to do is try to blast the internet with as many very, very cheap impressions to likely buyers of the product. And this becomes effectively arbitrary who gets credit. You cannot tell me that one of these impressions deserves far more credit than the other. They're all effectively equivalent and probably none of them cause, cause the conversion. So a, a very common technique among ad networks is, uh, is to try to get credit where credit is not due. Um, you also have the fundamental problem, which is correlation and causation are not the same thing. So two consumers buy the same product and consumer one just happens to have seen the impression on their path to buying something. Suddenly that impression is held up as the gold standard, as, as the causal impact of actual economic activity when consumer two just happens to not see the ad. So when you talk about advert marketing in general and advertising in general, there's a lot of activities which are which take place between the consumer and the conversion. Um, and the consumers in reality have very complex funnels by which they decide to purchase a product, some of which are advertising, some of which are just their friends telling them to buy it. Um, and so when you think about the complex funnel a consumer goes to convert, um, the impression, the one that's digital and has a cookie, I'll get to that in a moment, is the one that gets credit. When in fact, all this other activity, some of which may dominate the actual marketing budget, um, is, is treated as an afterthought. A different way to look at that is that um, different technologies may measure different kinds of exposures to ads. Um, so the, um, in a traditional um, kind of tech hierarchy, you may have a set of, of impressions and exposures to ads that are measured by an ad server where per perhaps an agency has hands on the keyboard and they're the ones who are measuring attribution based on what they see. But then you may have the marketer the, and advertiser with their analytic system that has a bigger uh, set of available um, exposures to measure against. Most people will not run affiliate impressions, for example, through their ad server um, or email newsletter links. Um, so the analytics now has a bet more robust set of data by which to attribute. Um, but then the end marketer uh, or someone in the analytics group, let's say at a marketer, may uh, do experiments and may be able to see the results of print ads or TV ads or other things which are, non, uh, which are not measurable by the analytics system. So different people in the same uh, media 
pipeline may have very different views over what is actually working and what's not. So uh, everyone's favorite topic, <coughs> cookies. Um, so uh, much of online last click, last impression attribution is based around IDs, either cookies or mobile IDs. And so just to, just to put a fine point on it, you could have two consumers exposed uh, clicking on ads, seeing impressions, and one of the consumers leaves their cookie and the other one doesn't. And suddenly the first consumer is, uh, is being attributed very differently from the second consumer because the data has, is more robust over time. Further, you have a strong bias against uh, users who don't have cookies. So uh, in the example here where consumer one uses Chrome, which I recommend everyone use so we can get those cookies, and consumer two has, has bias against the advertising industry and so uses Safari, mm -hmm. uh, boo. Uh, you, have, you are able to track the impression and it's more valuable on Chrome, but the impression on Safari was just as valuable. Uh, you just can't measure it. All right. So, a couple of years back, um, the big hot idea was multi-touch attribution, and this idea was to say it wasn't just one impression or click that got all the credit. We should look at the holistic path of the user, and this doesn't nearly solve all the problems I mentioned, but it is a very different perspective on the same problem. So, once again, we have a user. They're exposed to a series of impressions over time, and then they convert. Instead of giving all the credit to the last impression, you may wait which impressions get credit. So you may say, uh, well, we'll give half the credit to the most recent and 25 to the next two. That would be a pretty simple waiting option. Uh, but you could also do other things. Like, for example, you could have a complex waiting system that, uh, that has some sort of ratio based on time that goes back in time. You could also have a different system that does it based on the quality of the ad. Um, so, um, so one option for, especially for brand campaigns, is to do what's sometimes called first touch. So instead of saying the last impression gets credit, let's give the first impression credit. For example, it might be a very hard to reach audience, um, you know, young men gamers who have ad blockers on. So you want to give credit to anyone who can reach them. Another, um, another idea is to do an even distribution, to not worry about time, but just say, hey, if we reach this user, we should, we should be excited because they converted. I actually personally love this one because even distribution is effectively accepting correlation as your key criteria. We have correlated the impressions we bought with purchasers. Congratulations, we should keep buying them. And Rick will disagree. Ooh. Rick has several slides disagreeing with that. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. All right. So that is like the history of attribution in five minutes. I hope everyone enjoyed that. Uh, now, <laughs> I'm going to have over to Rick to talk about incrementality and beyond. There's some more techniques that are much more scientific based and hopefully will uh, make advertising more effective in the future. Excellent. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, so, yeah, when I see presentations like that, uh, I, I it, it, think, why are there all these different methods? Why, why can you pick? Why is it left to the marketer to decide which of these I like? You know, originally, I, when literally we were there at DoubleClick when attribution was invented. Uh, Jason Bigler and that uh, uh, exposure to conversion report, uh, you know, were the, my first introduction to it. And, and at the time, it was really more about a means to pay the publishers fractionally pay the publishers for you know being in on a cookie that converted and it was less understood in the beginning as really an ROI tool but it's evolved into this ROI tool and I my response is always there is one method that is the best of all the methods and that is the scientific method and this isn't like you know a faddish thing when we talk about incrementality it is it is finally a wave of enough advertisers catching on to the fact that 25 years by the way we just celebrated the 25th anniversary of the banner ad about a month ago uh, 25 years later, the industry has matured to the point that technically it's possible and enough of the practitioners are interested in actually getting to the right answer. Uh, you know, incrementality, think of it as the R in ROI, the return on investment. The problem I think that we've gotten ourselves into in advertising is that we mistake the conversion with the purpose of the advertising, which, you know, we, we think that what we're supposed to do is predict who's going to convert tag them with a cookie, and then when they convert, claim credit for it. But the job of advertising is not to predict 
who's going to convert is to persuade people to convert, is to change. And that is causality. That is what we're selling in advertising is a causal effect. The scientific method is ultimately observation plus experimentation. And as advertisers, we do the observation part great. Multi-touch attribution. I mean, everything we just saw, the fact that we can take all these this data, truly big data, and structure it, time series, blah, blah, everything Ari just showed, Ari just showed is fantastic, but we don't do the experiment part very well at all as advertisers, and we pretend it doesn't matter. The correlation shows us what we think the hypotheses should be. Huh, these two things seem to align together. Maybe this is working. That's your hypothesis. You then test your hypothesis and scientific method with an experiment. And uh, it's happening. Leaders are doing this today. And those who are not doing it, you know, uh, market share is a zero sum game. In pharmaceuticals, people die if they don't test this way. In advertising, nobody dies, but people lose market share and they lose their jobs. And smart companies are at the head of measuring right. Uh, and ghost ads, you know, is one of the technologies that's really a game changer here. And again, you know, for years, I've been singing the same song and everyone's like, oh, God, you're just talking some research, blah, blah, details, blah, blah, who cares? Uh, who cares is like Netflix and all the D to see is eating the lunch of all the traditional companies that are content with doing it the 20th century way. Uh, and literally, the answer is, why is this better than doing it the way we've been doing it? Because science. This is the hierarchy of evidence on the left, which is a popular ranking of how believable and good and accurate different popular measurement methodologies are, according to scientists. This one was presented in 1989 to the US Department of Health by a team of experts. I've translated it into marketing ease on the right. And at the top of both is randomized controlled trials. And everything below that is not a real experiment. Everything below that is observation and correlation based, or as uh, I describe it, judgment based uh, approaches. And, and when you're inserting judgment into it, you, you can unwittingly bias it. When you run a real randomized experiment, you're having the clearest understanding of what is causal. So let's you know, talk about other ways advertisers measure lift. Uh, one being uh, very popularly, everybody who presents you a report that says lift in the advertising, whether that's brand lift or you know, I'm thinking of third party vendors for measurement effectiveness, uh, offline sales in the grocery category or in the retail category, foot traffic, uh, you know, did they come up after seeing my ad, did they show up at my store? All of those folks are using an approach like this. And they show you a test group and a control group. So what the hell are you talking about, Rick? We already got a control group. No, you do not have a randomized control trial. You have a synthetic control group, which is really just dressed up observational data. It means that all the impressions is in Aries illustration here, you know, were to a group that was exposed to the campaign. And then they have another, well, they have a larger panel of buyer data, let's say. Let's say you're talking about, I don't want to name them necessarily, but one of the big CPG in-store sales measurement companies. There are a few big ones that have uh, buyer data from loyalty panels. And they see millions of households. And they, you pixel the campaign. They see who in their panel was exposed to the campaign. And then they take everybody who was left over who wasn't exposed to the campaign. And they make a look-alike model that they call a control group. And they measure lift off that. The problem is they've made all sorts of determinations judgment based as to who should belong in that group. And again, because science, it is just not as reliable of a way to measure lift. Another way that's probably familiar to people are geotest match markets. Uh, here we have an example of just two cities, uh, could be more complex for like television or digital search is often done this way, where you can buy, you know, there are 210 major market DMAs and you can patch together two halves of the country, those that see the ad and those that don't see the ad. You can even call that a randomized test if you flipped a coin as to which one was going to get the ads and which was, was not going to get the ads. The problem is you can't really get those populations to line up well enough that things like big weather events and problems in the supply chain and other factors are not 
going to influence the sales maybe more than the advertising. So, so that you would use this maybe as a rule of thumb kind of test. Like you do it once and you say, oh, we've proven that television works somewhat, right? And then you go to your CMO and say, we've proven television works, give us a big budget. Is that how you think about this? Television has the least problem, I think, making okay. the argument well, to spend sure. money. But yeah, you could. You know, a better way to do it, though, would be now with addressable television, you could do yeah. actually household to household randomization. But this is what traditionally people have done. It's just what you described. And you can't do New York or LA because there's no comparison. There's, there's, it's the one and only New York City. All right. Yeah. Uh, but yes, uh, you know, it's probably better than nothing, but the technologies are coming online now that it's, I think we're, we're at the beginning, like of the incrementality boom, the way that 10 years ago was the beginning of the attribution boom. You're going to see a lot more of this practice. And there are a lot of people talking about always on experiments. So you put 75% of your budget in the safe, tried and true stuff. You put 15% of your budget in what looks interesting promising and you put 10% of your budget in the stuff that you're just wondering if it works or not. And you test, test, test all the time. And there are better ways to do those tests. You know, this blackout test is another kind of extreme example. There have been, uh, you know, examples of companies, eBay famously in search, uh, I mean, people using this kind of technique for search where you just turn it all off for a period and see what happens. Uh, very difficult, you know, to, most advertisers, and I think they're right, believe that the advertising works. You know, the, the thing is, if you can get it to work better than your competitors, you win the race. You, right. Just because you're running doesn't mean you win the race. And how long do you turn it off? Because, you know, you might have a longer purchase funnel. Someone saw an ad last week, then you turn it off, then they convert. You know, it causes all kinds of problems. Exactly. I mean, again, it's, it's you know, for something like search, if you have the cojones to just turn it off for a month. Yeah. It could be fairly compelling. It could also be Christmas season or it could be, you know, weather disasters or who knows what. But uh, it's, again, you know, a uh, this is an experiment. This would be called an uncontrolled experiment. There's no control group. You just, you know, drop the Mentos in the Coke and watch what happens. That's an experiment that doesn't have a control group, but uh, it's a kind of a crude experiment. So finally, we come to my passion, which I'm going to spend the next two hours talking on this one. <laughs> <laughs> Randomized controlled trials. One more acronym or abbreviation you all need to put in your heads. Uh, some of my slides, I say RCT equals ROI. Uh, it's, again, the scientific method. It's worth remembering because it's been around for hundreds of years. You randomly, the, the, the difference is you do an intervention. And you decide ahead of time, we're gonna put randomly 5% of the people who otherwise would have been exposed to this campaign. All the targeting conditions, all the ad tech, you know, conditioning is exactly the same, but by some randomized intervention, we're gonna show 5% of these people something else. And, you know, 5%, it would be better if it was a bigger number, but because we're talking about PSAs, public service announcements, Smokey the Bear, Red Cross ads, you know, long history of advertisers doing this, particularly in digital, you definitely get cleaner results. The problem is you got to pay the money for a PSA ad. So you have to have a warm heart. And You're paying then, actual media dollars to run actual Smokey Better ads on actual websites. And not in the cheap run a network inventory, no. in the exact same inventory that you would have oh. run. Because the question is, you're targeting a given audience. In that audience, what's the incremental effect of the advertising? Because if most of those people would have converted anyway, but you're paying a high premium to target these people very selectively, would they have converted anyway? Yeah, this is the key and the key fact that you may want to be cheap and run the control group on affiliate ads or control right. group but on a different uh, run a network's a different audience. You have to run the control group right. on the exact same expensive rich media homepage takeovers in order for it to be a good test. Exactly. And the randomization reduces the measurement biases that the judgments and the, and the algorithms that, you know, we use today uh, con confound things with. So this is a good way to do it. The problem then is it, because it's expensive, they don't make the control groups very big, maybe one or 2% or even 5% may not be big enough statistically to measure the effect that's happening, uh, you know, with the ads. Because you may only need one or 2% lift in sales on your campaign or less than 1% to have positive payback, mm -hmm. you know? So, which brings us to ghost ads, which is this 
way that it's got this cute name that uh, some scientists, a couple of whom were working at Google at the time and a Boston University professor wrote this influential paper in 2015 and named this approach uh, like this. And it's since been adopted by a bunch of uh, companies in the space. And the idea is you don't, I mean, effectively this is a placebo. It's just not one you pay for. You know, it, it was invented at Google in the ad exchange uh, environment. And because Google in the ad exchange has effectively perfect knowledge about which ad request generated by a user hitting a page and loading the ad going into the exchange, uh, according to all the rules of the exchange and the bidding and everything else, they know which advertiser they would award that impression to, but they intervene with a, an experiment and recognize that that user has been assigned to the control group. And so they throw it back to the auction and let the second best win it, in effect. You know, it doesn't have to be an auction environment. You know, if you don't run it as an auction, but you're a publisher, but you could just substitute, okay, we would have awarded it to this guy. We made the decision, but we intervened. We're going to award it to a different advertiser instead. That is basically ghost ads. You know, what I've circled here, you see the 40% size of the control group. That's a bit arbitrary. It could be any size. You could have a control group that's bigger than your test group with a ghost ads mechanism because you are not, as the advertiser, paying any cost for that control. So it, to read this this slide, Macy's is the advertiser, right? And yeah, Macy's okay. is advertising. And then every once in a while, 40% of the time, Macy's should have won the impression. They should have shown their ad, but instead we've swapped out a different advertiser. Right. We've let somebody else win it. And then critically, we record in the database that Macy's would have won. Would have won. And so that record in the database is the ghost ad. The, the, the ad for Macy's never gets served, but you're saying this user would have been exposed. We're going to tag them as if they were exposed. So yeah, thank but, you for that clarification. And they do not care about forest fires. No. Right. And we, nobody has to spend money running the, those PSAs. I should have also built a slide for ghost bids, which is a slightly different way that this uh, manifests in uh, bidder, in the DSP side of things, where you, uh, you have more uncertainty, but you basically, you, you don't know the bids you're going to win, but you bid on the tests that you like for the bid. And the controls that you like for the bid, you basically record a fake bid into your database that we would have bid and we would have bid this much. Uh, and then you know that like everybody in the test group is in those that you bid on in the test group, but maybe only one 10% of your bids. Uh, it is a robust uh, experiment as well. It's just a, a variation on how to do this if you don't have the certainty that the exchange of the publisher does. So there's a lot more to say, and believe me, I love to go on and so, on, but uh, <laughs> we've reached the end of the allotted 30 minutes. So are ghost year. ads as effective as PSA in terms of, uh, in terms of the certainty? Arguably, yeah. You know, yeah, you, you, if, I mean, instead of serving, you know, even when we serve the ad as the publisher, it's still not everybody in the test group gets treated mm -hmm. because some of them back out their browser before it loads right. or whatever, or it's below the fold. So we count them as a test group, but really the test group's a bit smaller, but uh, uh, I forgot the question you asked yet. But <laughs> <laughs> so, so with ghost ads, you basically have it, a yeah, real scientific have something experiment. very similar mm -hmm. to what, if you had actually served the placebo, you're re recording it the same way. You're recording yes. that instead of actually serving the, the other creative, you serve this creative, but you record it in the database the same way. So I, I would say it's just as robust as possible. Great. Well, thank you all for sticking with us. So there should be a Q&A box on your Zoom. Uh, feel free to type in your questions there, and we'll go through them and uh, try to take a little bit of time uh, for those. If you have to drop off, we are going to be sending a link to the video uh, of this Pod, of this, uh, I was going to call it a podcast. We should start a podcast, right? I think people would right, I'm in. Uh, the, uh, we're going to be sending a video of this recording. So uh, type in the Q&A and we'll go through it. Um. Okay, first question from our audience. What in the auction bid logs indicates that it was a ghost ad? Well, really, I'll, I'll take that and you can add to it. Really, you have to uh, instrument it in your DSP. So the DSP needs to, in a bidding environment, the DSP would need to um, have sort of a hook that would say, um, this, this advertiser could have won, but we're not going to show it and we're going to declare it a ghost ad. And then the analysis would have to happen afterwards uh, based on that signal. Yeah, you can't really 
infer it from logs, you have to make a um, an intervention, as I say, mm -hmm. to assign some to the control and treat them as a control, right. rather than just finding the ones that uh, they were around the same pages. Let's call that an impression, not quite the same thing. Exactly. Okay, next question. How about intent to treat? This seems popular with advertisers with less tech, though often I think there are problems with saturation of the test cells. Yes, that's a wise question. Uh, so intent to treat is another form of an experiment, a randomized experiment. Uh, in an intent to treat, you define the addressable universe in advance, so, you know, and I'm speaking in terms of ad experiments. So let's say you have your total cookie universe or, or uh, whatever is your other ID set, and you segment it into, let's say, 50-50, half is control, half is test. You run the campaign in the test, and you just hold out. Uh, you don't run anything in the control, and then you don't try to determine who in the pre-established pre addressable test set was actually reached. So you might have only reached 5%. Like let's say you started with the whole households of all America and you didn't spend a lot of money and you only reached fairly small percent. Uh, you've got all that noise of the test households that weren't treated. I mean, if you're Walmart, you can reach 80% and, and lots of the Americans shop regularly at your store and spend a lot of money. Uh, it's much easier for you to read the lift signal with this kind of approach. Uh, yeah, the bigger challenge for regular advertisers if, is if uh, they would have enough signal in the test group to read the lift. So not as good as ghost ads. Correct. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. How do they control if the ghost ads are in a different category? Uh. Category. A different category. Uh, oh, like a different advertiser category, I think they mean. Like if you're advertising. Yeah, it else. doesn't matter, right? Yeah, because, you know, somebody who is the second in line to bid for that impression could either be a competitor of yours, right. and that's why they're targeting them, or they could be somebody who likes them for a totally different reason, totally mm -hmm. different product. Uh, or it could be Smokey the Bear. As I long it, as it could be a problem if it's a competitor, a direct competitor. Yeah, yeah. I think if it's a direct competitor, there have been discussions in the literature of ways to try to build algorithms to right. protect against that. And and as you said before, you know, whether as the bidder or real ghost as from the publisher exchange standpoint, it has to be instrumented by the media company. Right. So there, there has been, though, ad addressing how to deal with that in the literature. In ghost ad experiments you've run, what is the ballpark range of uplifts you've seen? Well, uh, you know, the, the lift, uh, so I, I've done a number of these experiments over the years, and um, the lift can be small. Like if you're, you know, a big box retailer with, you know, there's one I have in mind that we did some experiments for that uh, on the order of 30% of households patronize in, I think, a six-day period. And the average transaction size is $100. And we moved the needle less than 1%, but about a half a percent on the audience uh, penetration. So of everybody who's reached, what percent showed up? And there was about a half a percent difference. And that was plenty for you know half a percent of all American households at 100 bucks to pay back. So it, it, you know, and you'll get these crazy return on ad spends. The lift themselves, it's hard to move the needle, you know, mm -hmm. detectably. It's usually they're well below 10%. Ads don't always work. Sometimes. Yeah. Not always. Do you see advertisers paying different rates for impression to conversions versus click to conversions? Um, well, I think that um, it, the preference of impression conversion or click to conversion is going to be largely determined by the advertiser. And I think that uh, like, for example, in mobile, um, click to conversion is actually fairly well used because it, view through is very difficult to measure. Um, whereas in, in uh, I think, more traditional desktop, almost everyone uses a combination of those things. Um, I, I think it's, I don't think the prices vary that much. I think the, um, the dedication to the measurement varies a lot and people take uh, those different measurements um, with different grains of salt. Next question. When running a ghost ad, how do you ensure the customer isn't exposed to other ads or communications? Well, ghost ads are typically implemented only within one media space. So Google has built a system like this. Facebook has built a system, Pandora, 
Pinterest and, and a bunch of DSPs. Uh, so you cannot ensure that somebody, you know, if you're running the experiment as Google and you're also running Facebook advertising, you cannot keep them out of the control group. And likewise, they're going to be exposed to television and magazines and out of door and everything else. What Google can convincingly measure for is what was the effect of spending your money with Google? What did Google contribute to the lift? Uh, beyond that, there's all the cookie decay and, and identity mapping issues that, you know, trouble our industry. But, uh, and, and there is also a possibility for the control group to get contaminated. I mean, there, there are ways to do it, to be refreshing your IDs regularly to make sure uh, and to try to reconcile at the household and various techniques. But we're hoping that the pollution of the uh, contamination of the control group, like in one media spaces measurement is less than the measurable effect of the advertising. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, last question, isn't ghost ads also better than PSAs because the PSA approach in reality will show the PSA campaign to different people than the focal campaign due to delivery optimization and budget pacing? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. Yeah, I think you have to be very careful of how you set up the campaigns in a, in a DSP environment. Uh, because if a DSP is optimizing budget, let's say, based on click-through rates and no one's clicking on the PSAs, you will show, uh, you won't be able to control effectively the delivery and other things may uh, intersect with how it works. So I, I think setup is absolutely key for both PSAs and for ghost ads um, because it's very easy to make a careless mistake and end up with an invalid test. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that point has, has was made as to one of the reasons why ghost ads may be superior in the original paper mm -hmm. uh, to PSAs for exactly that reason. Yeah, that's most pronounced in like e-commerce kinds of clients that are doing that click optimization. Uh, yeah. Well, great. Uh, so thank you so much for spending the time with us. Um, like we said, we're going to um, send out a link to a video of this, uh, of this presentation uh, and are happy to take additional questions by email to either myself or to Rick. Um, we also have uh, for-profit businesses. So if you need any DSP bidder services, call me. And Rick, if, uh, if people are looking for uh, experimental frameworks and, uh, and better results from their advertising, you can call Rick. Please do. Thank you. It was a pleasure. All right. Thank Thanks you, everybody. Everybody.